technical input into both proposals that India wanted to put forward, but even more importantly, on global proposals, because the Indian government and our agencies had absolutely no idea what these species were. They, they, they would often ask me, well, is this thing a fish or, or a timber? Or what are we talking about here? Right? So, so you had to actually lead them through uh, the species, uh, the threat to trade, etc. You had to lead the governments through the fact that we are not talking national protection. We are talking trade and international trade and the threat to species. Very often, countries, not just India, but many countries would come with long prepared statements of what they're doing to protect that species in their range state. Not necessarily understanding that this convention was about the international trade and the effect of that. And while some sovereign statements made sense in terms of a country statement, but really the, the time of the parties was to deliberate whether the trade was affecting the survivability of that species uh, and how to moderate it or, or regulate it or in certain cases ban it. So all these sort of technicalities were things that we brought in. Uh, the technical expertise of ivory, I was sent to Fish and Wildlife Lab in Ashland to learn, right? So I, I can see many stalwarts here from Dan and uh, Sue, and, and, and I, I can see uh, there are more people, Marshall, in, in, in among the people uh, watching. So there were many people in the U.S. who actually helped train some of us uh, in bringing back the technical input into India. And now when we have reached a stage where I see in Panama, where I saw India proposing and getting through a Jaipur Hill gecko, uh, I, I was absolutely thrilled that the country has reached a technical ability to draft a proposal on a lesser known reptile uh, and, and, and get it through CITES. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge, uh, you know, uh, evolution. India has been very vocal at CITES on all issues, but technically the skill is now built uh, rather lately, I, I would say. I That's very interesting, Vivek. Could you give us a sense, because we've talked a lot today about um, all manner of animals, both uh, terrestrial and aquatic. Haven't heard a lot about plants. And, and one thing I've noticed with India is an interest in certain tree species. Could you give a, a bit of an insight there? Because quite often the plants and the, and the tree species, in particular the high value tree species, don't get as much attention as perhaps they deserve. What, what's, what's been your experience there from a perspective of uh, engaging with uh, the Indian delegation, but also from a, a non-government and intergovernmental uh, perspective? Yeah, so I mean, uh, the, uh, there, are, there are two parts to it. I mean, one is that the Indian government in the earlier days uh, engaging with CITES was extremely protectionary in its vision and therefore wanted to protect the endangered species. So although in the early days, the focus was on animals, but I remember uh, we, we did put forth uh, three plant species, medicinal plant species, 20, 20 years ago, uh, in, in the early years of when I was on the delegation, uh, to, the, to the extent uh, that I had to argue for those species to be included in the medicinal plant uh, category, to the extent that I was put in the IUCN medicinal plant specialist group for many years. I had to keep protesting to them that I, I'm not a botanist. I don't know anything about plants. But just because as a government delegate, I had actually um, argued for those medicinal plants. So there was, there was some interest there of protecting endangered plants. But when it comes to trees, like you said, or even uh, aquatic fauna like sharks, uh, when it was fisheries and timber, the Indian government had, 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 had several other issues to think about. Uh, I think uh, in India, unlike in some parts of the world, we don't utilize our fauna, terrestrial fauna that, that much. In fact, most of it is protected. Almost nothing is utilized in, in, a, in a hunting manner or, um, uh, or a trading manner under law. So except very few exceptions, there are two or three very small exceptions. <clears throat> but we do utilize our timber and we do utilize our uh, uh, fish. And therefore the question of 1.3 billion people's uh, requirement and need to trade in that species versus the actual need to protect some of those species will um, inevitably came into play. So as a result, India has had to take very mixed stances on some of these uh, uh, tree species that you're talking about, uh, but uh, I think has, has really had a, a, a level playing field in, in actually proposing and co-proposing several things which are endangered and therefore by the trade and therefore wanting a regulation on it. And in other cases, arguing that for livelihood purposes where there is 
a large uh, uh, commercial plantation, for example, that these be deregulated de 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 uh, and in fact move down to Appendix 2, or in some cases, uh, India has also argued that it should be out of CITES. Yeah. So um, we, we, we have had uh, very, very interesting uh, discussions within the uh, CITES task force in the ministry, uh, and of course, uh, within CITES in the standing committees, plans committees, and, um, and in the COP. Fabulous, really interesting uh, perspectives there, uh, Vivek. Um, and and it, I appreciate the fact that you spent some time talking about plants as well. Um, and uh, no, really, really interesting there and the, the different perspectives on different species, how that can vary as well, depending upon the impacts it has on, on local people. Um, I'm going to there move on to Dr. Jin Feng Zhou. Uh, delighted that you've been able to join us and you have a number of people in China that are live streaming. So I'm sure they're very much looking forward uh, to hearing from you. And uh, China uh, has attracted a lot of attention under CITES um, for many years. And you've been involved with CITES issues for many years. How did you uh, get yourself involved in CITES and, and how are you currently in, involved with CITES? Thank you, John. And uh, we as a, a civil society or non-government organization, deeply involved and we believe people's participation is a very important part of implement the CITES. For example, and we use our social media uh, to promote and to get, have people awareness of CITES related uh, regulations and uh, uh, about the endangered species. Our daily view every day we have over 30 million views every day. And also we organize the, every year we organize the college uh, uh, environmental competition test. And every year we have over 1.5 million college students in China to participate. Within those uh, uh, questions, we put in cities related uh, questions, issues, and then species. And uh, with through all those online uh, activities, we help people, especially young people, to understand, to participate. That is the key. For example, before the ban of every trade, total ban in China, with our volunteers report to us, one, one of the major stores in China are selling in the last month are selling every products with a support with a one major bank and a, a bank support them to give special supports including discounts including favorable policy policy after that at that time is is not illegal but uh, our volunteers report to us we read articles criticize that uh, bank and we wrote to that bank. The second day, the bank make a very important announcement. They stop this suppose. They, although it's not illegal at that time, but they make it clear they have very strong stand to support cities and the government, every bank. And through those activities, uh, we make a very big involvement of of the business people, as well as with the support of the volunteers, especially after the ban, the 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 black markets, the internet market, the free. There are many new ways of. It's not easy to 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 control to uh, by the government, but uh, we motivate nationwide. We have hundreds of thousands of volunteers. They check internet, they check their neighborhood stores, then they have to report and they read articles and put on our social media. That is a, made a very strong uh, people's participation and strong support of the government's policy and the new uh, law that all is part of uh, said his implementation, we feel quite uh, uh, positive towards the participation. Thank you. 
Very good, uh, fascinating, and, and certainly the uh, experience with the closure of domestic ivory markets, and I was fortunate enough to, to go to Beijing and, and witness some of that and the destruction of ivory um, had a huge impact on taking pressure off the range states uh, of the African elephant, and we've seen the result uh, on the ground, and you're a big part of that. Can I, can I um, ask you a question? The, we still have some challenges with um, wildlife trafficking, um, and I know you're very active on that because I'm one of those 30 million or billion or how many you mentioned that are, are following your, your activities. You, you, you are, have a very good social media reach. Um, we still have some challenges with wildlife trafficking. And I, I did see, and you were quoted in an article recently about uh, certain captive breeding facilities being closed down and how you were assisting the uh, Chinese government and the Chinese government authorities uh, ensure that those uh, new rules were being adhered to. Could you share us with us some insights as to how you support enforcement authorities uh, with their work, uh, including on things, for example, like um, ensuring that closures of these captive breeding facilities are, are uh, carried out? Thank you. We uh, send our volunteers to uh, each individual uh, farming, facility with the license uh, uh, as, uh, for example, as a pangolin, we visit all the licensed farming and we take pictures, we talk to them, we view, we find none of them are really farming. In fact, it's part of the uh, network to have the illegal trafficking. So they with the lesson, of course, at the very beginning, they are trained to farm, but it's not easy to farm pangolin. And with the lessons that help them to illegally sell, treat uh, the trafficked, illegal sell the, from overseas to China's pangolins. We find those, we report to the government, and uh, we do the uh, visiting, we organize, uh, uh, motivate our volunteers. We found, every year we found over 100 grassroots NGOs to support them, the, the local activities. And through all those uh, procedures, we strongly support to clarify those things. And I would like also to tell you, uh, to, to, to talk about another story. In 2017, all eight species of pangolins are listed the Annex 1 in Bacetis. But that's uh, January, in fact. In the January, uh, February, the, the second month, we search, we organize a volunteer search internet. We found some pictures of 23 years, uh, two years ago, some pictures, and we retreat, we tell the story. That picture is about a young entrepreneur to visit Nanning City. He was treated by Pangolin Mill, by the local officials to promote investment. We tell that, we take that whole story out and we spread that. Within few, very few days, we get over 100 million views. And many people told us they didn't realize it's illegal to eat pangolin before. And although the, there is regulation, there is the Annex 1, there is the law, but it's, we need to take the opportunity to, to then make it quite a very widespread and understanding. And we also wrote to the local of, uh, government. The, that official treated the, the Hong Kong entrepreneurs was finally sentenced 10 years in prison. Of course, he's also uh, together with his uh, corruption, not only the, the eating pangolin, but that shocks many, many people, especially those in the business or those of local offic uh, uh, the officials. They starting that day, they, they, they realized this is not right. So I will, what I want to see is uh, the law that said is everything is good. The government are strongly pushing that, but the people's participation, the civil society's participation, and uh, we're strongly 
people's support will also strongly help the government to implement the, the cities domestically. And for example, another example is we filed a litigation against the pharmaceutical company. This sell by pangolin scale, but uh, it's not, uh, 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 according to the pharmacopoeia, uh, uh, at that time, it should be Chinese pangolin, but uh, they are using African pangolins, and which means is illegal, and which means is not right, even through the traditional medicine point of view, it's not that real species, that real, the, the, count, the products are not right. And uh, only after the litigation, nationwide authority are trying to uh, rethink about, it, are stopping to give the permits for them to produce those, to use those products. And uh, through those examples and uh, the civil society, the people's support towards the uh, gun authorities uh, to implement the city, we have uh, very great uh, results. And uh, we see uh, that encourage more uh, volunteers to participate and uh, to uh, help to implement, uh, to help to get the awareness and to eventually to get the, to, to protect the, the endangered species and our own inhabitants. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Jingpeng Zhou, for sharing all those examples. And I must say, it gives one a great sense of encouragement. Uh, the outreach you have is extraordinary. You know, the numbers are massive, but that outreach and the engagement with the authorities, I think, would give everyone online a great sense of encouragement. Uh, about uh, the work that you're doing to ensure that the rules are being adhered to. So fantastic, really appreciated that very much. Colleagues, we're running a bit late for time, but we're gonna stay on for another 10 or 15 minutes if you can do that. I'm going to turn to uh, Professor Maria Ivanova next. Um, Maria has done a vast amount of work looking at uh, UN Environment Program, uh, looking at all multilateral environmental agreements, in particular the most significant ones and doing a comparative analysis. She's going to take us through. She's going to compare CITES with some other conventions so we can benchmark CITES against others. After that, colleagues, I'm going to bring all of us back. I don't have time to go through all the things I know we'd all like to talk about, but I will give you an opportunity uh, for 30 to 60 seconds to offer your final reflections on anything that came up today that you would like to, to offer an observation re regarding. So for you, Maria, and then we'll open it up to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I have been studying international environmental governance, which includes the core UN institutions, the UN Environment Program, UNEP, and the various multilateral environmental agreements. And I want to take off um, on something that several of you have, uh, have mentioned, but Winnie highlighted uh, quite a bit is the need for knowledge and understanding what the Global South is doing. And I have to say, through our work, creating an environmental conventions index that actually measures the extent to which countries implement their environmental agreements has produced a story that is quite positive and even somewhat counterintuitive that shows what the Global South is doing. And I want to walk you very quickly through some of that work that we, we have done. At uh, I am now at Northeastern University in, uh, in Boston. And uh, here is just a snapshot of CITES implementation. The unit of analysis that we take that tells us how CITES is being implemented are the national reports that countries submit to the Secretariat. As you can see, there's quite a bit of gray in Africa, and these are the data from 2003 to 2014, because this is quite labor intensive. It takes a lot of students to do this work, and uh, I'll show you some of the later work that we have done zeroing on, on Southern Africa that's a little bit more recent. But the issue here is that 
countries do not necessarily report. And this is one of the two CITES reports. This is the biannual, also called implementation report that actually informs the secretariat what are countries doing in terms of information, in terms of legislation, regulation, management, and financial issues. And uh, four, no, five countries around the world have scores of four or more. We go from zero to five, with five being the uh, highest implementation, and there are five countries around the world. And those are the Philippines, the United States, Malaysia, Thailand, and Peru. You wouldn't think. If one asked you who are the countries that implement CITES to the highest uh, level, you wouldn't think of these five countries. And so I think the United States has something to be proud about and to share with the rest of the world on international environmental agreements, as do countries, especially in, uh, in Southeast uh, Asia, and uh, Africa does have a challenge. And several of you noted that in, uh, in the questions. But I want to compare very quickly with the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. It is another biodiversity convention, but there the reporting rate is much higher. It's upward of 85%. And the uh, countries around the world report. You see the deep green is where countries are also reporting that they're implementing the convention to a higher level extent. And so you see in, uh, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, the convention is being implemented. Here's a zero in, in Southern Africa with a little bit more recent data. And these are courses that we offer now together with UNEP to countries, uh, governments around the world. We have offered these uh, courses on implementation of environmental conventions to countries in uh, North Africa, in East Africa, in Asia, and the latest one was in Southern Africa this past November. Uh, you can see Zimbabwe here is performing better than any of the other countries in Southern Africa, but the other countries are also not lagging too far behind. If we are to do a comparison, this is another group of countries that we have for we had for another course from around the world. So what you see on uh, on the lower axis is just the countries that were in the room, and so we we compared them. You see, Malaysia performs better than Canada, better than than Switzerland. This type of story of telling how countries are implementing the conventions, implementing the agreements that they have agreed to, presents a really positive story where we could highlight the, the good performers, whether it is Malaysia or whether it is Zimbabwe. We can link them up and say, why? How are you doing this? What are the kinds of policies, procedures, processes that you have put in place? And this kind of work also inspires countries to report. You can see the scores of zero here for Fiji and Ghana, just because they had not reported. We had the same story with Switzerland, and it was the Swiss government that supported us. And when we went to report to the Swiss government and we gave them, you have a score of zero. That was 2013. And they said, how? Why? Because you have not reported to CITES. And they said, oh, it's not the Ministry of Environment. It actually is the... A veterinary office in Switzerland. Since 2013, Switzerland has been reporting regularly on the implementation of, of CITES. And uh, here are the top reporters with the 100% reporting rate. Um, and you can see among them are Barbados and Bolivia and Qatar and Thailand and Slovakia and the United States. So once we present that kind of, of information, it is not about being developed or developing that you can report to these conventions. What is it that, uh, that actually determines reporting? And just to finish, uh, we have compared the conventions on chemicals and waste or on pollution, that's Basel and Stockholm, with the biodiversity conventions. Predictably, developing countries are more challenged on the chemicals conventions, but they are actually doing better on biodiversity conventions. And this is a story that needs to be, to be told 
and to be shared with the rest of, uh, of the world. Here is the, the Basel Convention on Transboundary Movement of Hazard Wa Waste, that, that map, and the Stockholm Convention, where you see developing countries have a lot more challenges. I'll, I'll put a few uh, links in, uh, in the chat. This is an article that, that is open, open access, and I'll put the UNEP book in the chat, which is also open access. The key here is that academia is part of civil society, but it is a different, a different entity. We can rank, we can compare, and we can provide that information that then inspires young people who would join government or civil society or business. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Maria. Really interesting analysis. And, and hopefully that also encourages um, states that get access to it to report more vigilantly. And I can see Vivek has already responded to you in the chat box saying he wants to have a bilateral with you about reporting uh, from India. So you've already got uh, one rather large country uh, engaging very directly with you. So that's good, colleagues. That um, will bring to an end uh, our discussion with this panel. Rich discussion, very interesting perspectives coming from different places. Um, I think this issue of capacity, not just the capacity of the state, but the capacity of the non-state actors, the, the civil society engaging with CITES is quite a challenge, especially as the standing committee becomes more complex, the COP becomes more complex. And that's something that we might want to reflect upon as we join together for this final discussion. So if we can invite everyone to turn on your cameras, perhaps stay muted until you talk. I'm going to come to the panelist first and give you 30 seconds to one minute. Then if we have time, I'll come to our commentators and then see if any of our speakers, Rosemary, Susan, or, or Sophie, you'll get the last word anyway, uh, would like to add anything. But if I could invite you, and I, I'm going to go in alphabetical order through our panelists, to offer your final reflection based upon everything you've heard today, pick up on any issue you like, reflect on the next 50 years, but I'd like to give each one, one of you an opportunity to, to have a closing comment, and I'm going to start with you, Dan, and then I'm going to Sue. Dan. Thank you, John, and thank you, everyone. It's been uh, it's been informative and educational. Um, I'm going to come back to my, the the statement I made about capacity. I think you know we live amidst the the uh, the planet's sixth mass extinction event. Um, species are going to be more and more imperiled as we move ahead in the future. Uh, instruments like CITES are going to become more and more important, but more and more stressed. And so I think both governments and civil society have the obligation to work together to make sure that we have the resources to implement these treaties, um, not just continue adding burdens to the treaties without the resources to make them work. Um, and so that's my, my most important message looking forward. Thank you, Dan. Sue Lieberman. Two very brief messages, and anyone is free to get in touch with me if they want to discuss this further, any of this further. With increasing climate change, globalization, habitat loss, habitat destruction, trade pressures, wildlife trade, legal and illegal, is not going to go away, and it's increasing as a threat to species in the wild. So I encourage everyone, particularly those watching or, or listening, et cetera, youth, to get engaged and engage with CITES. This is important, and we need to keep working on this convention in order to, it's not about promoting trade, it's about ensuring that trade is not a threat to species in the wild. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sue. Vivek Menon, over to you. So uh, very quickly, uh, John, um, uh, what, what I want to say, and I don't want to repeat what others have said about the urgency for people to work together. But when we talk about working together, so far we have talked about uh, government and civil society coming closer together. Uh, what I want to say is that the, the, the developing world, where you've seen challenges, whether in the graphs that Maria has uh, put, put up or uh, you or anybody else working in the Secretariat would have seen in terms of capacity and many other issues, have much to learn and share from each other. You did mention in the beginning about uh, my dream of the 50 elephant range states working together, but it's not just the elephants. It's a developing world. I, I really think that Africa and Asia and Latin America have so much to learn from each other. And this could be a potent block, really, not just a voting block, but a capacity building block within CITES and other conventions to move us forward uh, in some of these uh, 
areas in the next 50 years. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Vivek. And now over to you, Winnie Kiru. Okay, to me, uh, two things. First is to recognize this very important role that civil society has played, especially in helping countries that do not have resources to meaningfully participate in CITES and to legitimize that and to see them as an important part of the convention as opposed to constantly going at them as suspicious or so to really just understand and appreciate that they are playing a very, very important role and they need to expand that role and they need to be able to be facilitated to help countries to do what they do. The other thing I would like to say is that information, research, data is so important for us to be able to articulate what is happening to species, holding information, extractive research, taking and not giving back is not going to help us. And I think that for those of us who are now in the research space, one of the uh, decisions we have to make is to ensure that research done in Africa, research done in Asia, re research that's done in Latin America must be relevant to our needs and must help us to articulate our challenges more powerfully and more meaningfully, not just in CITES, but in all these different places and must help our people to have the capacity to do it. So away with extractive research that just leads to a thousand PhDs somewhere else and does not help us to articulate our issues powerfully, meaningfully, and in a way that actually helps species. Thanks, Winnie. Um, now, Will Travers, and then we'll go to you, uh, Jingfeng Zhou. Will. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. Um, so thank you to ADMCF for hosting and you, John, for facilitating. It's been a really fascinating event. In my 30 seconds, uh, I'm repeating some things others have said, but nothing wrong with that. Country level, in investment in country level implementation of CITES, capacity building, and to be fair, more money to the Secretariat who seem to be massively under-resourced. Uh, greater participation of LCIP and civil society from the global south, and how do we do that? It's a challenge. I just say that if we didn't have CITES, we'd wish we did, and you can reflect on that. Uh, happy World Wildlife Day when it comes, and I look forward to seeing so many of you at COP20, wherever it is. <laughs> Thanks, Will. There's a few committee meetings before then you might see some people at. Thanks, Will. Um, Dr. Jin Feng Zhou, over to you. Thank you. I want to say all of us, no matter it's Global South or North, developing or developed, uh, government or non-government, we all must do our best to protect our uninhabited. That is part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to move to our two commentators, Jonathan and then Maria. Thank you, John. Yeah, I agree with pretty much everything that's been said here. Um, and I should just add that CITES has already made an excellent contribution to tackling this biodiversity crisis. It's pretty well designed, but we can do better. Uh, particularly, we need to focus on better implementation and better enforcement. And, uh, and also the, the contribution of civil societies is vital to achieving these goals. So I hope the governments make the fullest use of civil society. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Maria, and then I'm going to come to you, Susan, and then Rosemary and Sophie, you'll have the final, the final word. Thank you. Thank you, John, for engaging me in, in this, uh, this work and uh, me, for meeting everybody. I want to make three quick points. One is the role of the knowledge sector of academia, not just in getting the information, but in telling the stories and highlighting what is happening around the world. Two is the role of the secretariat. Well, when you were in the secretariat, there was a boldness, there was a courage, there was a, a, a desire to be out in front. I would like to see that more and more with more secretariats and more executive secretaries or secretary generals. And three is the role of small states. We often forget about the states that are leaders and that are relatively small. And we define small as be as those who punch above their weight. 
We need to find the stories of the states who punch above their weight and put them in front of other states, of other governments, but also in front of a global public. Great, thank you very much, Maria. Now I'm going to come to Susan, Susan Lalas. Thank you, John. Thank you um, to everyone. This has really been a, an incredibly informative event. I'm gonna just go back to Washington DC for my comments. John, you were struck by one thing throughout, not just the event on Capitol Hill, but the numerous meetings that we had with members of Congress. The question invariably was, what can we do? I think we need to keep Congress engaged. I think we've seen a lot of political will and desire and there, it takes a village. So they're, they're definitely part of that village. Thanks, John. Thanks, Susan. And uh, Rosemary Nam, over to you. Thank you, John. I guess I'm very awed by everything we heard today and humbled by all the experience every all the speakers brought. I hope that that experience can be passed on to the next generation of the CITES leaders. I'm, I'm struck that we really do need to break build that depth. And I hope at the standing committee, I can expect civil society to actively engage, but be concise. And as you said, find their alignments so we can stay on track because I know we will have an incredible agenda, but I welcome all of you to participate. And it is the strength of CITES. CITES has teeth as we've heard, and we need civil society and everyone who has information to help us make sound science-based decisions that are thoughtful and deliberative. Thank you, John, for the chance to be here. Thanks, Rosemary. And no, big thanks to you for taking on the role of chair of the standing committee. We're all sure you'll do a great job and your, your efforts at inclusivity are really well appreciated by everyone. Um, with that, colleagues, before I hand to, Susan, um, to um, Sophie, because she's going to wrap up as, as our host, I just want to say, you know, huge thanks to all of you for participating, uh, making yourselves available, sharing your time, sharing your extraordinary insights. I mean, the experience that we've had access today has been quite incredible. So a really stimulating session. I think we've all learned a lot, whether we've been to 15 COPs or none. Uh, this has been a, a, a learning experience. Um, I hope everyone online enjoyed it. We will be providing the recording for those who weren't able to join us today. So big thanks to all of you. Let me also ex express a very large thanks to the ADM Capital Foundation who have hosted us today and pass it over to Sophie at CEO to wrap it up for us. Sophie, over to you for the final word. Great, thank you. Um, thank you all so much for, for, for today and this evening. Um, I think the next 50 years is going to be the most critical for the world's wildlife as the natural environment we're facing challenges, wildlife's facing challenges, exacerbated by climate change. And I think this makes CITES all the more important. Um, so that's something we really have to focus on. And very heartfelt thanks to all of you for pro providing such fascinating insights into the extent of the work and the passion involved in regulating the trade in wildlife. And some from very personal and insightful perspectives, particularly thank you for Winnie for reminding us why we're all here. Um, that was a very emotive um, few moments with Minnie, Winnie there. And last but not least, I'd very much like to thank our sponsoring organizations and always, as always, to John for your expert moderation. Fantastic. And, not, and last but not least, I'd like to say happy birthday to CITES tomorrow. Good night all. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for everyone for joining Thanks, online. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, folks. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.